we started going out picking up our, our military observers who were in various locations, picking up our UN staff, picking up diplomats, um, picking up people at risk. And we started a whole series of, of what we call rescue missions to go pick people up, try to locate them. Beardsley went to rescue Polish Catholic priests trapped with two UN observers in a Kigali church where Tutsis had sought refuge. The uh, military observers and the priests could hear people screaming over the church, so they left their quarters and had come over to see what was going on. They were grabbed and they were put up against the wall with rifle underneath their chin, and they were held there while the identity cards were, were captured and were burned. And then the militia came in and the gendarmes literally, the police literally handed them over to the, uh, to the militia, who then proceeded through the rest of the evening to, uh, to chop them apart with machetes. Inside the church itself um, were about 150 people. About 15 of them were still alive. The rest had been uh, attacked with machetes and had been killed. And, and the thing that stood out in my mind up until that day, it almost bore the resemblance of a coup, uh, taking out the moderates. But this was different. This, this was this was just ordinary men, women, and children, and the only reason whatsoever that they were killed and targeted was because they were Tutsi. Behind the ceasefire line, the Tutsi rebels of the Rwandan Patriotic Front were preparing to respond. The information very clearly came in very fast, showing how targeted killings were being carried out and how these were spreading out, not only in Kigali, but going beyond Kigali to other parts of the country. And we knew that was the usual style. The massacres had started. And we have to take action. The rebels declared the peace process dead and attacked the extremist government. General Kagame had gone through training at Fort Leavenworth. The U.S. military maintained contact and understood the rebel leader's intentions. In retrospect, there was no chance, I think, that, that the RPF uh, was in any mood to, to negotiate right from the beginning. They wanted what? They wanted to take control of the country. They wanted to take over control politically, militarily. There was no way you're going to stop the RPF. There was no way that they were in the mood to negotiate once this all started. Overnight, 1,000 French and Belgian paratroopers had arrived without warning, seizing Kigali Airport. These troops were not under UN command. Their mission was solely to get the expatriates out. Dozens of journalists had arrived with the new troops. They traveled with Belgian soldiers to Kigali's psychiatric hospital, where the Western staff was trapped. On the way in, they drove past the Interra Hamway, waiting outside. Tutsis emerged from the hospital building, where they'd been hiding for three days. They said they were surrounded by the militias, that some of them had already been killed. When it was clear the soldiers weren't going to help, the refugees appealed to the journalists. It was a whole group of people, but in the whole group, one woman started to speak and started to explain why they were afraid and what was happening to them. And she started begging us to take her and the others with us. She was speaking to me, a woman to a woman, saying, I'm afraid, please help me. Yeah, we were just listening to her and then we couldn't do anything at that moment. We thought we couldn't do anything, just listen and say yes. 